What a motley looking crew. Well, congratulations. You made it to day three of the conference, or day two if you're the sort of person who likes to index from zero. I'm thinking a lot of you like to index from zero. So my name is Todd Whitehead. Uh, we're going to go on a strange journey today. We've heard lots and lots of cool talks this week on all the latest and greatest. This is not one of those talks. This is a talk that seemed like a good idea at the time, and I'm pretty sure it's a good idea, but I'll leave that up to you in the end. What we're going to do is have a little good trip back in time to see how that can address some real-world problems today. So just a quick poll before we start, get a feel for the room. Who here has ever committed code that triggered an automated build? Awesome, awesome. Who here has ever owned a computer that did not have a hard drive? Ooh, nice, about half as many, about what I expected. Let's try this one. Who has ever lost their connection online when their mother picked up the phone in the kitchen? Awesome, okay, you're my people, you'll get this. And for everyone else, thank you for coming to learn from these experiences. So, as I said, my name's Todd. Now, like probably a lot of you, I started out as a child. Pretty happy child. It was in the 70s, you know, so everything is kind of that wonderful purplish tinge that everything looks like now. It wasn't really like that. Um, but I grew up in a family that had kind of an engineering background. My grandfather had a TRS-80, taught himself to program, all this kind of good stuff. So I was around tech from an early age, and I even worked out early on containers are a pretty useful thing. I still don't know much more about them than I did back then, but that's okay. So I continued to learn about tech and grow, and I had two things going for me. Obviously, I knew about tech, and obviously, I was a pretty snappy dresser. Now, back then, I wasn't really sure where, what kind of career that could lead to. Um, I probably didn't need to worry, because on the other side of the planet, there were some older but not dissimilarly dressed people starting a company called Microsoft. Notice Dash, Microsoft, Micro Dash Soft at the time. Um, and probably about the time the photos of me were taken, these guys were making their money licensing their version of BASIC to all computer manufacturers, including a company called Commodore. And we'll, we'll touch on that again soon. So things progressed. I got older, luckily, as you do. Grew up through the 80s. And when I say the 80s, I don't mean these 80s. I know they existed, and it's what people tend to think of as the 80s. This kind of parachute, silk-wearing, mullet-growing wasn't really my style. I mean these 80s. Who remembers these 80s? These 80s were awesome, right? And your homework after this talk is to go home and watch all these movies. They're still awesome. Um, and it kind of gave me hope as a, as a young kid that, look, if I really develop my computer skills, I might actually meet a girl. That'd be cool. Failing that, you know, we can build one, which is only moderately creepy. And look, we can be the hero and save, you know, maybe save the world. Tr true, in most cases, we were the ones that put the world in jeopardy in the first place, but that's, that's really not the point. So flash forward years later, I've been a software developer, I've been a tech lead, I've been a scrum master, I've been all these kind of good things, worked on projects really exciting and really scary and really annoying, but found up, end up working at Microsoft, talking to people all about cloud and building th awesome things in cloud. And having those conversations almost inevitably leads to conversations about DevOps. Because it is that not just building the same app somewhere else, it's that kind of idea of cloud being a transformative kind of thing with, with different ways of developing and, and delivering value. Now, this isn't a talk where we're going to go into a lot about what DevOps is. There's been lots of great talks this week on that. But I do like this definition from, um, from Uncle Donovan Brown, where he says, it's the union of people, process, and products. And that order is super important. It's not accidental, that order, okay, to deliver value. Um, and there's been some great talks this week on, on that. And that's, my, you know, that's the one Microsoft tends to use, but if you look at um, Amazon and Google's, same concept, right? It's valuing that culture, that people part of it. So that's great. So I go and talk to lots and lots of people about stuff, including DevOps. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's a really big multinational company or a small startup, it always tends to start really well, 
and I'll, t I'll you know, throw out some facts and figures from the you know, Dora reports and things talking about how much more productive, how much more reliable, how much more value that gets delivered. But just inevitably, at some point in that conversation, I'll look around the room, because I know it's coming, so I just got to find them. I see this guy, and I see the eye roll, and I go, aha, you're my guy today. So this person looks different, but we're going to use this guy as our model. We'll just pick a name out of the air, Hans Gruber. He's our guy, right? And he's clearly not sold on any of this stuff I'm talking about. And you start to drill in what are his concerns, what are his issues. And what's really interesting is almost always the objections flip that order around we talked about. It's always the technology and the products that are the problem. That's what's getting in the way. He's not putting his hand up saying, I don't want to change. I don't think that will be a, a better thing for me. No, no. It's all sorts of technical objections as to why it won't work for them. Maybe it's process, but usually technical. So, and he throws out a whole lot of them. And the problem with this is, unless you know that technology he's talking about, like in a lot of detail, because he'll just rattle off all sorts of reasons, it's really hard to kind of say, well, that's not true and challenge them without going away and researching it. So the idea of this talk was, I wanted something I could just mic drop in a kind of techie nerdy way to say, look, we can do this with DevOps. So if we can do this with DevOps, and I admit, I don't know that tech, and I'm happy to talk to you about it, but if we can do it with that, I'm pretty sure we can do it with what you've got. And that's the idea of this talk, to give you that same story to tell, um, and or to come up with your own one and build the same thing. So I thought, what's something ridiculous I can do? Because usually when we talk about DevOps, you know, we can do a file new project and build something new and shiny. It just works, it's easy. I can go into Azure, I can go give me a new DevOps project, it's Java using the Spring Framework, and it'll give me a Hello World app and the release and delivery pipeline already built. Awesome. That's not going to convince this guy, right? Because he's not buying into any of this Kubernetes.core node stuff. He's just not having it. So it had to be something more out of left field. So reaching back into my childhood, although my children will probably tell you I never really left, I thought of this thing. Who owned one of these things? Nice, right? The Commodore 64. You're probably not alone. It still, to this day, holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most number of computers sold. Still today, right? Because they never changed it. It never really upgraded. The one we're going to do, use today uses a newer case, physical case, but the bits are still the same, right? And it, it was manufactured for 12 years, right? So imagine what your iWatch or your iPhone or your Android pod was like 12 years ago and think if you'd still be using that. So that was pretty cool. So that's what I decided we'd use, partly because it's so old and ridiculous, and partly because, just like this room, lots of people remember this and remember what it was like. So therefore, it would have a connection. That was the theory, anyway. So this thing was powered by the 6502 processor. Um, and it wasn't alone. There was a processor developed in the mid-1970s. So it powered everything you see here, from the Apple I, the Apple II, uh, the Ataris, the Atari 2600, and even the Nintendo uh, Entertainment System, and even those really annoying little Tamagotchis. All powered by that thing, and it's actually still made today. You can go and buy them. Um, so lots and lots of things had them, and if anyone's a Futurama fan, you might have noticed Bender was also powered by a 6502. Um, and if you were really observant in the first Terminator movie, he was also powered by a 6502. I have a link to that code if you'd like it. It doesn't create you a killer robot, sadly. So. The chip wasn't unique. So there's clearly something else going on for this thing to be successful. Well, there's a really frustratingly non-technical reason. Uh, Commodore did a fantastic job of selling this thing. So before the Commodore 64, computers were sold in computer shops, maybe electronic shops. Commodore took them to retailers, to your Kmarts, to your Toys R Us, and sold them by the bucket loads. It also had another couple of advantages. It had a fantastic graphics chip, something much better than anything else has. And strangely, we wouldn't even think about the, it today, the sound chip, the SID, was awesome. We're going to get into that. But to, just, just to give you an idea of the scale of this thing, at its peak, they were shipping half a million units a month. Right? That is more than the rest of the PC industry, including IBM, combined. This thing was selling like hotcakes. And there was a reason. 
And it was kind of a virtuous circle. Because it was so popular and because it ran for so long, software developers really took to it, right? And really started to learn how to exploit the platform. And there's lots of business apps and lots of all cool stuff, but you know, I don't know, probably for most people in this room, we remember the games, right? The games were just awesome. Actually, some were really terrible. Most were awesome. Uh, we could just stop here and watch that for a while, but we won't. So there's our challenge. That's what I want to get out of today. Uh, the hands DevOps challenge. So what do we want to do? Well, first thing we need to do before we even get to that DevOpsy part, we need to figure out what is a realistic inner dev loop. Can we be productive developers in this stuff? Because it's no good having super slick deployments and monitoring whatever if the person who's actually building stuff isn't having a good day. So that's the first check. Then, as Donovan would say, we're going to rub a little DevOps on it. Right, so we're going to see how we can take that program we've built, add source control, all those kind of normal things you would expect in a DevOps pipeline, um, and hopefully, I haven't got any wood, I'll touch this, by the end of this we should be able to do all that and end up running from a cold start on this thing. We will all think positive thoughts to the demo gods. So when I started thinking about this, I thought, okay, there's a few ways we can do this, because you know, clearly the scariest way is to do it on stage in front of people on a real one, that would be ridiculous. So obviously, there's lots of good emulators for this. This is a great one. And one of the nice things about the Commodore stuff, someone still owns the IP, which is always one of the problems with old, you know, shall we say, hazy IP ownership. So you can go to this crowd, and you can buy licensed the Commodore 64 ROMs in this thing. And if you've got an Amiga, you can even go and buy Amiga ROM chips. It's fantastic. So that's an option. And we're actually going to use that as part of our inner loop to, uh, to do our rapid testing. If you're super keen, and I was, and I bought one of these, you can buy a new Commodore 64, which is this thing. It's called the Ultimate 64. And if you see this little thingy up here, all the rest of these connections up here are the original connections, all good. But you'll notice over here it's got something weird. It's actually got USB ports, it's got a HDMI port, it's got a network port. Because this thing is actually an FPGA implementation of the Commodore 64. So I thought, well, that's fantastic. So I bought one of these, because now you know I don't have to worry, it's easy to connect, it's whatever, and I did a version of this presentation. And the guy came up to me at the end and said, that was awesome, but you were still cheating. OK, all right, fine. Um, and oh, by the way, so I've already told a few people, someone actually bought the molds for the cases. So there's a guy in Germany. You can go to his website and order yourself a brand new Commodore 64C case in any color you want, which I did, but we can't use it because that's cheating, apparently. So we're going to use this. This is an original 1985-ish, I think, Commodore 64C, unmodified. Uh, I just took it off, cleaned off the goop, checked the capacitors hadn't exploded, and, and we're all pretty good, right? So we're good to go. Well, not quite. Strangely enough, I opened the user guide, something I've probably never done, because, you know, it's this thick. It's not like a modern user guide. And it had this awesome diagram of how to connect it. Now, there's two big problems on this. And the first one is this. See this little simple rectangle here? It looks so simple. Plug in the power supply. Don't plug in the power supply. These things are terrible. Even when they were brand new, they had a failure rate of 30%, right? Because these things were made by the millions, and it was just easier to replace them to fix the problems. And just to make life a little interesting, it has no voltage protection. So when it does fail, it fries your computer. So don't you do that. So I had to get a new power supply built. Um, I've got this one here, a Ray Carlson one, um, one of the original Commodore service engineers. He, he's online. You can go on. He'll build you whatever you like. So awesome. We can plug it in. We've got power. Now, the next problem is this. Now, the younger people here probably don't recognize it. My kids didn't recognize it. Yes, that's what televisions used to look like. Now, I don't have a television that looks like that. I don't have a television with the connections that look like that. So how are we going to get this to display on this big screen up here? Well, look, it's pretty straightforward, because the Commodore 64 actually had three ways of sending signals. RF, which you would tune on your television station. Right, well, that's out. I don't have uh, one of those anymore. I've got one of these things. Right, an LCD. So that leaves us composite and a thing called luminance and chrominance, which you may not recognize, but if I call it S video, it might make more sense. This is basically the forerunner to S video, but of course, just to make life interesting, it's not compatible with S video. The, the signal strength is out. That's okay. And just to make it even harder, this is the plug. Right, so no plug goes into that. So that's okay. So luckily, we have the internet. So someone has made this thing called the Super AV adapter which is up here, plugs into the back using the cord, 
and splits that out for us into an S-Video and some RCA audio, which was really handy for my good friends in, uh, in the crew up the back, because when I got here, I realized it doesn't, the audio from HDMI doesn't actually play here, so we had to quickly, luckily it's got those jacks. And that's awesome, right? We can plug that into something now. Well, not quite, because that video signal is still running at 15 hertz, which is really slow. It's probably slower than I could run, right? No modern display will display that. So we need to add a line doubler or an upscaler to take that signal, do some funky digital stuff, and, and get it running fast enough. Woo, now we can connect. Super exciting. Now, when we do this, we got that. Now, one of the interesting things about the 64, you see up here Basic V2, and you remember my Microsoft friends? This is Microsoft Basic, licensed to Commodore. One of the really clever things, a guy called Jack Trammell, which is why I'm saying thank you, Jack, did when he negotiated with Microsoft is he negotiated for $50,000 an unlimited uh, royal uh, runtime uh, unrestricted license. He could sell as many as he wanted for that. That's a mistake Microsoft wouldn't make again a few years later when they did a deal with IBM. Right? But what that meant was he bought that in the mid-70s. He's not going to pay another buck. He's not that kind of guy. So this is basically the same version of BASIC that shipped all the way back in the mid-70s. So it's a great computer. It can do lots of good things. Didn't have a lot of cool stuff uh, that came with it. So there was missing a few common things you know, we might kind of take for granted today. You know, things like directory listings and copying a file and you know, those sort of things. No, didn't really have time for that. So this is how we loaded the directory back in the day. I'm sure everyone's remembering that. You would load dollar comma eight and you would list and there's your directory. Of course, if you've been writing any programs, it just got wiped by doing that directory listing. But hey, stuff happens. So this thing, what we see here, it's not really a command line. It's actually a full screen editor, right? You can do whatever you want and go all over the shop. The problem is, if I wanted to do something simple like Hello World, and I'm sure more than one or two of you went into Kmart on the display unit and typed this in and ran, because you know we struck a blow for nerd freedom. Um, but if we wanted to do anything more complicated than that, you had to start doing this stuff, poking, which is not as exciting as it sounds, and peaking is not as bad as it sounds. Basically, we're writing stuff directly into memory. And we'd, I'd, well, personally, I'd get code and I'd type this stuff in, and if I did these commands, you know, oh, look, an A and a B would show up there. I have no idea why at the time, right? It would go on and on. So there's lots of weirdness about this machine. But that's okay. So we need to set up a dev tool, dev tool chain to let us work in that weird environment, but be productive. So we could do this on the Commodore 64, but I don't want to. It isn't fun. It wasn't fun back in the day. And in fact, a lot of the programs for it were not developed on it. So we're going to take that same model. So the first thing I need is an editor. Now, I'm going to use VS Code. I like VS Code. Who uses VS Code? Awesome. Um, if you have a look at the stats from Stack Overflow and things, the other advantage of this is this is not just popular with developers. It's popular with IT pros and all sorts of other things. So thinking back to our hands, what we're trying to show him, that this is a tool maybe that everyone can use, not just developers. So that's really cool. We got that. Now, because I'm not working on the Commodore 64, I need to have some kind of cross-assembler, something that can take it and generate the code I need. Frighteningly enough, there's a lot of them. I picked this one because if you look at the date, the active dates on these things, they're actually still heavily developed and heavily used. So awesome, I can use this and uh, assemble. We're not gonna compile, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, then for my inner dev loop, we're gonna use one of those emulators I spoke about, because I don't wanna have to deploy it to the 64 to test it, I want something much faster than that. For that inner loop, so we'll use that, super cool. But then for the DevOps, I'm gonna use, again, the stuff I know, right? I'm gonna use GitHub for the repo, and then Azure DevOps boards and pipelines for all my other DevOps stuff. Pretty straightforward, so awesome, we've got an environment. Now if I do that and I fire up my code, I get this. So cool, I've got an editor. It's pretty much notepad at this point, right? There's no IntelliSense, there's no color coding, there's no anything that you know I'd usually like, but you know, it's Visual Studio Code. I could write an extension, right? Well, turns out I don't need to. If you go into the extensions and search for Commodore 64, there's already a whole bunch. Yeah, you know, yay community. Um, and this is actually more amazing than you think because I don't need an extension that does Commodore 64 code because each of those assemblers actually has their own syntax and whatever. So I found one for the exact uh, cross assembler I'm going to use. So happy days. We've got IntelliSense, we've got color, syntax highlighting, all that good stuff. 
Okay. Oh, come back here one sec. Now, one thing you will notice back in this day, of course, there's no kind of project file or solution file. You know, all the source code is explicitly in, you know, built into here. So therefore, you know, Visual, uh, Visual Studio Code doesn't know how to build this thing. So I could do it from the command line, but again, Visual Studio Code for the win, uh, it has the concept of tasks. You can just create this little, oh, I'll go back. You can create this little task.json file. You can tell it what the command line you want to run. In this case, I'm calling the Acme compiler, giving it some parameters. And hey, press do, I can just go run task and do what I want to do. Now, one thing I did learn along the way, is I started off just by assembling and deploying it to the thing. That sounds awesome. The thing I found, even with a simple program, it ended up being about mm, 100K. Now you go, 100K, that's awesome. It is until you try and load it on a Commodore 64. 100K takes a long, long time. So I actually found that you needed another tool which would compress that file down to about 2K. And when we get to the end of the demo and you see how long it takes to download 2K, you'll, you'll appreciate why that was important. So we've got a dev environment. We're productive. We can build stuff. Let's think about the code we've got to build for a Hello World app. So if we were doing this in .NET Core, we could go .NET New Console, and I'm pretty much walking off the stage. I'm done, all right? Here's our Hello World. It's created namespaces. It's done all these kind of things. If I got really, really excited, I could add a few lines and add some color to it, all right? And if I run that, awesome. I've got a Hello World app. But to make that magic happen, there's a lot of stuff helping me. Right? So there's .NET Core runtimes, there's system libraries, there's OS level stuff, there's video card drivers. The exciting news is we don't have any of that on the Commodore 64. Right? And it's probably a little bit of a clue, when you open the user guide, not the programmer's guide, the user guide, it gets all the way to chapter two before it starts teaching you how to code. That was the first clue that, huh, okay, this might be a little more work. And of course, if you actually look at the programmer's guide, which goes into a little bit more detail, it tells you how to do pretty advanced stuff. And if you open up the back, it has a full schematic of the motherboard. I don't know how many of your programmer's reference guide have a full schematic of the motherboard. And there's a reason for that. We're going to need to know this stuff. So strap on. This is where we get a bit low level. So I kind of told a lie before. I said the Commodore was powered by the 6502. It's actually powered by the 6510, which is the same. Um, but Commodore actually bought the company, MOS, that made the 6502, so now they can do whatever the hell they want. So it's the same chip, they just reorganized the pins a bit to make their life easier. So what we have on this thing is eight pins for the data bus, so that gives us eight bit bytes, zero to 255 is our biggest number, and then it's got this wonderful 16 bit address bus, so we can address up to 64K, hence a Commodore 64, which was so important in the time, it's in the title, not much of a shock. The funny thing is, when you power up the 64, here it tells us 64K RAM, awesome. And I've got 38K free. What the heck? You're not doing very much. Why have I only got that much memory? Well, turns out, if you open up the Commodore 64, you see all these cool chips. So over here is the VIC. This thing does the display. Here's our wonderful SID for our sound. So here's the kernel. Yes, it's spelt that way. Uh, the basic, the good old Microsoft stuff, and the character sets here. This handles all the input output. But the only way any of these things can talk to each other is via that same address bus. So if we look at our 64K of memory, lots and lots of memory, we can address 64K, but this yellow bit, that's the only bit we can use because things like the cartridge ROM, because these things take cartridges. So that's blocked off, we can't use that. This thing has all these other things and some special bits of memory up here. Oh yes, there's our 38K. If we have a look up here in this green, there's a thing called screen RAM. Because when we want to write our program, we're going to have to actually write directly to memory. So we're going to deal with that. And there's another block way down the bottom for some reason to deal with color. Because in effect, we have this screen memory map for the Commodore screen, which is 40 columns across, 25 down, awesome, which is all little memory locations. Now these things, we can't draw pixels on the Commodore 64. Right? These are cells. These hold a character. All right? So if we want an A in the top corner, we could type poke, 1024, 1, one being an A, Woo, we get an A. If we do want to put something down two lines, across a little bit, we've got to figure out how many cells across that is. Perfect, we can get a B. So that's the kind of thing we're going to need to do. 
Unfortunately, it's still not that simple because we can't write to an address memory directly. That would be way too easy. So here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to work out what the value of our character string is, specifically put into a bit of memory, you know, none of this variable stuff, actually write it to somewhere in memory, and then who's built bots? I'm excited by bots. Are they not the same bots? Do these guys get a new gig? I don't know. Um, but we've got our new bit of memory here with our message in it. All we're going to do is load it into these special registers, put it into there, so put it up into the accumulator, hmm, cool, and then give it another command to copy it off to the screen. Do, 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 do. So that's what we're going to have to do. Now, luckily, the, uh, the, the uh, assembler does give us some helpful little utility, so I don't have to do that byte for byte. I can just give it a string and it'll do that magic, so that's really cool. And then just all I've got to do really is, is some really simple looping. Copy, you know, set an index, load into the accumulator that, store it, yeah, 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 yeah. line by line, character by character, copy that across to get some text on the screen. Uh, this, this, by the way, is when it came really in, the Windows 10 calculator is awesome because you can add, you know, binary 1101 to hex whatever and it'll give you the answer. Really, really handy and I won't say stop me going insane but certainly slowed it down. After we do all that, we've got some text on the screen. Ah, okay, that was a little bit more work. Remembering the aim of this exercise is to convince Hans he hasn't got anything that isn't harder than this, right? But there's still something missing, right? That's, that's cool. It's a hello world. It's certainly not very 80s, though. So we're not really, you know, kind of showing off what you would really do on the platform. So we need to add some color, right? So I don't know if anyone remembers the weird palette of CGA and all those kind of things and the Apple II. Awesome. Four colors at a time. The Commodore 64 could do 16. It was awesome. Guess what? Same, same idea. We've got another big slop of memory. There's different colors, and basically for each cell, we tell it what the foreground color, background color, away we go. So that's really cool. Eh, there's no helper for this. So for every little byte in that array, we've got to do it byte by byte by byte to specify the different colors. And then we're going to have a cool little loop, which again, same sort of thing, right? Set some index, store in the accumulator, and store it into the screen memory. And once we do that, we can Go up to our little run menu terminal. It's so exciting. Run the task. Do, 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 do. That'll fire up our little emulator. Run it. Now we've got some color. Now we're looking a little more 80s. It's getting there. It's getting there. But what's missing? Come on. Who lived in the 80s? Computer games. Sound. Thank you. Sound is missing. We haven't met the SID yet. So the SID is awesome. And in fact, I don't think even Commodore realized how cool this was at the time. Um, it could only play three voices, three sounds at a time. The VIC-20, its predecessor, could play four, right? And it could play only these one, two, three, four different waveforms. But what it could do is two things. One, you could really control a whole lot of variables about that sound, but also you could change it on the fly. People eventually worked out. Different sound channels can make different sounds. So to give you an idea of what that means, let's kind of visualize each of these lines is one of those three voices. start to get some very cool sounds, right? And you got to remember, think back, this is Apple II days. This is when most computers were going beep, bleep, 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 bleep. This is pretty cool. And there was actually a bug in the chip that affected the volume. And what some really clever programmers work out, who remembers this game? Right, what was cool about this game? The speech. Right, so there's, they added a way to work out digi add digital samples by exploiting a bug in the volume control, because the volume is just binary on or off. So if you flick that really quickly, you can create some really cool sounds. Ah, now it's all coming back. All right, and. People are starting to remember this a little more fondly. I missed this. I was really annoyed. If you were in England a few months ago, you would have seen this. This is a full orchestra version of some of the best Commodore 64 game music that was ever done. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So, given how hard it was to add text to our screen, how hard do we think it is to add sound to our program? Who thinks it's going to be easier than the text? Who thinks it's going to be harder? All right, let's have a look. That's it. 
What the heck? Okay. The first thing we're doing up here, we're just, remember I said we've got to tell it exactly where in memory we want it to put our stuff? This is just defining a few variables with a memory location. That's all it does. We have one line that says bin, so read a binary file of the SID file. This is the music file. And then we, this is, forget this, this is just a label. We JSR to that memory location. JSR meaning jump to subroutine. What the heck? Turns out when you write music, the music file doesn't just contain the music, it contains all the machine language instructions to run that music. Separation of concerns, not such a big thing in the 80s, but made my life easier, so what the heck. So we can add that, we've got a SID file, we can do our little terminal run task again, and hopefully, all being well, we're starting to get a little bit closer to where we want to be. That's, that's definitely feeling a little more 80s. Cool. So, we kind of got our inner dev loop sorted, now, we're going to put some DevOps on it, but to do that, I've actually created, an, that was version one, that was good, I've now got version two, and we're going to push version two through our DevOps pipeline. Okay, so really, I'm in Visual Studio Code, I'm using GitHub, so really, forget that it's a Commodore 64, I'm just committing code, there's nothing special here. We're now kind of at the point where a lot of these, the, the pecu peculiarities of the Commodore 64 won't matter, right? We're just using all our normal Git tools, putting in a vaguely useful message, committing it, and pushing that up to GitHub. Okay, so what we're gonna have to do here, here's kind of the steps we did on our local PC. We had Visual Studio Code, we assembled it, we compressed it, and we launched it. Uh, we're gonna commit that code up to GitHub, and you know, obviously in Azure Pipeline, we need to somehow replicate those same steps, or see if there's another way to build it. Now, I'm not gonna drill into this, but you know, I'm a developer, obviously, so I spent lots of time putting really detailed user stories and ignored most of them, but you know, in the real world, you would do that. Did you hear the slight snag? When I went to configure my pipeline, I looked at all the build agents uh, Azure gives you, which is awesome. Windows, Linux, Mac. There isn't a Commodore 64 one. I personally feel this is a failure. I've raised a user voice. If you'd like to go and support that, do that. But that's okay. We can just use the same thing. We'll use a cross assembler. Now, this is where it gets good because Azure DevOps has a really good marketplace and a really good way to build extensions. So all I'm gonna do now is build an extension that installs and runs those exact same tools I ran on the PC. Now, I've I'd never done this before, but it's not that hard. It took me about half a day. Their TypeScript, which again, I hadn't done before. I'd done lots of JavaScript, but not TypeScript, but same diff. Um, so really, that's all I've gotta do. So to do that, it's basically, there's a tutorial you'll follow. Inside an extension, you can install multiple tasks. Um, so in here, I've put sp specific ones around installing the tasks and then for running each of the tasks. Um, the, it's basically just a manifest file, which is all the info that pops up in the marketplace when you can discover it, so here's mine. It's, uh, I don't wanna you know, toot my own horn, but it's definitely in the top two Acme cross compilers available on the Azure DevOps marketplace. Well, that was just unnecessary. <laughs> yes, there are only two. And the other one didn't work, that's why I had to even do this. <sighs> anyway, so, the most of the code in that extension is really just metadata. It's stuff you're gonna to use to make it discoverable. So you can see here we got you know, version information, uh, we've got a whole lot of inputs defined, and really that's just so that when you install stuff, it pops up over here, you know, okay, here's the, this particular task in there. And the other important thing though is you define what are the inputs you need to give this build step. So there's a few different types there. You can see here we've got pick list, which gives you like a nice drop down list. Um, because the Acme compiler can actually compile for a whole lot of different architectures, um, all that kind of good stuff. And what that means is when I install my task, rather than having to t remember magic strings, I get like, pick lists, I get drop downs, I get all that kind of good stuff. So that just makes my life easier. Then within my module, when I want to get that value, um, comes with an SDK, you basically just say get input. That's it, not particularly complicated, right? So, and then there's a whole lot of uh, other utilities to th do things like download a tool, oh yeah. I don't have to do that myself. Just download it, extract it, and then it has a caching mechanism so I can, if I call it again, it doesn't actually go and get it. It's all good. Install it to the marketplace, boom, you can go and enjoy it today. Pretty straightforward. So my build pipeline looks like this. You know, install the Acme tool, install the cruncher, assemble it using a whole lot of variables I set over here, all the usual stuff. There is a couple of extra steps I didn't do before. Generate fileid.diz. 
Remember that? We'll come back to that in a minute. Basically, just generate a little metadata file with some of the build info. We'll come back to that. And I'm also decided I'm actually going to distribute this in a couple of different ways, not just the program, but also um, as a disk image so people can download it as a disk. Cool. And of course, I add the Chuck Norris build step because Chuck Norris is awesome. So when we do that, we run through, we get this nice summary, all the things that worked, and a little bit of Chuck Norris wisdom. He doesn't call dot dispose, he calls dot dropkick. We're set in the mood, we're carrying on, right? We can drill in if we want, drill into all the build details. Okay, so we've got full access to that. And after all that, we've actually produced three artifacts. Our Hello World 2, which is what we're going to run, a Hello2.d64, which is a 1541 disk image, also containing the program file, and that little metadata file we spoke about. And of course, I get dashboards and all the kind of good stuff, right? I didn't have to do too much there. It just all shows up. Awesome. So we've got our CI kind of part working. Now it kind of gets fun. Now we need to do the delivery part, right? So we had a few different ways of doing this back in the 80s. Uh, you could just, most of them soon involved printing out the code and making everyone type it in again. Uh, so these books were awesome. I don't know if anyone else remembers these books. They're all for free and available on the Osborne site. Go and look at them. They are fantastic. You did just have to cope with the fact that the amazing artwork didn't always live up to the game once you finally got it running, but that's okay. Uh, or you could get it from magazines, where again, you would type it all in, hope you didn't make a mistake, hope they didn't make a printing mistake, um, and maybe it'll run. And if the magazine was really cruel, they'd just give you this machine language and make you type that in, right? But yeah, none of that sounds particularly fun, and I don't think you guys want to do that. So the other way, obviously, was physical media. We could do this with cartridges. In Australia and the UK, most games were on tape because these uh, floppy drives were so darn expensive. Um, but later on, certainly floppy disks. So that's what we're going to use today, sort of. We're going to use that virtual floppy disk um, for one part, and then we're going to download the, pro the program physically in the other way. So how do we do that? Well, I've set up, because believe it or not, there is a JavaScript emulator for the Commodore 64. It's actually pretty good. So I've set up a static website using um, the Hugo uh, static site generating framework, because I'm trying to keep the cost down here. So it's just a static site. Um, I, my pipeline is really just going to deploy that D64 file to blob storage, and then I have an Azure function, which just every time something happens on that, it regenerates a JSON file um, containing a list of what all the disk images that are available. Right? And then I use some CDN, so now I can get HTTPS and custom domains and whatever. So I'm going to share this website with you later. You can go and go crazy on this. It's very, very cool. Okay, so here's our website. Um, what you can see, we've got, I've started publishing all the info related to this up in the articles, but there's an online 64 and a terminal. We'll talk about the terminal in a sec. But if you go to that page, this is a fully functional C64. You can go crazy, type your thing in. Okay, I did keep forgetting to turn the sound on, so I'll turn on the sound. Then I can browse here, pick some of the disk images, load that disk image up. This is version two. This is not version one we saw before. I've added a little bit more zhuzh, because you know, it's the 80s. There we go. Same ideas, just with a little more graphic. But you'll hear the, um, particularly in the sound, it's struggling to keep up, right? Pushing the uh, poor little JavaScript engine. Cool. So now we've got that. That's, that's basically going to serve as our UAT environment. People can go in there, quickly test it, find the easy bugs, and then we're going to deploy to prod. So how, how do we deploy things electronically back in the 80s? Who remembers bulletin boards? Awesome. This is the part where your mother picked up the phone and <laughs> screamed. Okay, so these were really simple. These were awesome. You could connect a modem up to your Commodore 64, dial a phone number, connect it all up. The problem is, if you wanted to send messages or files or anything to someone somewhere else, you either had to dial STD, like really expensive, you know, just think dialing America type charges in the day, right? That wasn't a thing. So the good thing was the bulletin board people got together and built networks. And what they would do is you'd post your file or your message to your local board, and then these boards periodically would dial each other up and just pass it along, right? There was no, I'm not sending a message to this guy. I'm sending to all the boards on the network, and this board eventually will go, hey, that's for me. So security, not much of a thing, but that's OK. So that's what we're going to do. So I've set up. On an Azure VM, the Mystic bulletin board system, that was a little bit of a learning experience. Uh, again, the good thing is there's still a community that maintains this. So they've added support for internet protocols like Telnet and FTP and things. Awesome. Uh, there is still one problem. They still assume you can, even though it's old, that you can at least display 80 characters. Right? Commodore 64 member, 40. So that's still a problem we've got to deal with. Oh, we're going to have to hustle. So I've set up a bulletin board, bbs.retrodevops.com. 
And believe it or not, these networks still exist. So there's a great one run and play by New Zealand. Um, but now, at least because we can use the internet, we don't need to do it one by one. We can just dial into a central hub and pass that along. So here's what it looks like. Beautiful ASCII art um, running there. And of course, because it's running on the Telnet port, it gets smashed every six seconds by, um, by my North Korean friends, but that's okay. It's got, it's got uh, ways to detect that. Cool. So now we're getting close to the physical thing. So to get that to work, we've got a few more things. This is the smaller revamped Commodore 64 disk drive, which is only about yay big. And I only by 100 grams made my luggage allowance with this thing. So that wasn't an option to bring that down, unfortunately. But that's all right, I've got his little brother. So this little doohickey here takes an SD card and implements and emulates a Commodore 1541 drive. Awesome, we can store and run stuff. And then we need to connect. So luckily, again, yay internet, uh, this little guy plugs into the back of the Commodore. As far as the Commodore 64 is concerned, it's a modem. I talk modem commands to it, if anyone remembers the Hayes compatible AT commands back in the day. Same, but the top half is Wi-Fi. I'll just skip, I've got to catch up some time, there we go. So my release pipeline, again now, looks pretty simple, right? I'm a good developer. I'm not going to put my credentials in the pipeline or the code, so I've put them in Azure Key Vault and pull those in as I need them. I uh, copy the program files from the build into the directory. Um, now, the bulletin board system wants it as a zip file, so I'm going to zip those files up, and that's where that metadata file we generated before, because the bulletin board will actually look inside, pull that out, and use that to populate its info. So cool, and we deploy to the bulletin board. Luckily for me, it supports FTP, otherwise I would just have built another custom extension to talk its weird protocol. We run our things, everything looks green, hands still not convinced. Okay. This is the part where things get a little hairy. Let's see, can we really, really do this on a Commodore 64? He says, finding the right button. All right, from a cold start. Is there, if you feel free to cross fingers or whatever. Wow, it's blue, isn't it? Who remembers that blue? Deep, deep, deep in our psyche. Okay, now you want, might notice the fast load. So I've also got in here a uh, fast, Epix fast load cartridge. Um, there was a bug in the Commodore disk drive from 1982 in the VIC-20 that they never bothered to fix that would cost money that made things really slow. So people created these cartridges that fixed that problem. So what I'm going to do, forgive me as I look down here, first thing I need to do, so here's all the disk images on there. Now down here somewhere, this is effectively the equivalent of me coming along and I want a clean one with nothing on it. And I'm putting the floppy, floppy disk in the drive now. Once that's done, cool. Now, how do I get a directory of that again? Comma eight, and this is a lot faster. If I did this without the um, fast cartridge, things like this take about five minutes. So we can see all our files here, awesome. And this has our terminal program we're gonna use to connect. Again, if I did this without the fast cast, fast, that's really hard to say, fast load cartridge, that would take about 10 minutes. So it's going to start up, it's going to still load, take a few more seconds, it's going to load some files. So this is basically our little terminal program that's going to connect us, hopefully, to our bulletin board system, and we're going to go from there. So, well, no I'm not, because why is that? He says, not checking that his phone is sharing its connection. Just talk amongst yourselves, it's all fine. Any questions while I'm, you know, it, it, did anyone notice too? The 1984 tech is working just fine. <laughs> yeah. Did anyone notice how long it took to boot the Commodore 64? Yeah. That's right. Load times, come on. Da -da -da -da. Uh, tethering. Yes, tethering has turned itself off. Somewhere there's a bit of battery saving software going, oh, I don't think he really needs that. Yeah, I do. I really do. Okay. Let's try that again. Uh, this little modemy thing has a very cool little um, LCD screen. So I can say, yay, now it's connected. Okay, let's try that again. Yay for fast load cartridge. And the funny thing was, I did not plan to do this today. This was all going to be running and we just jumped to this demo and I thought, mm, is someone going to still say I cheated? Because, you know, I have that fear. So we're doing it from cold, for good or bad, but, you know, we're all friends here. That's the shorter way of doing instead of load star comma 
Commodore run stop, yay. Okay. It says ready. I don't know if that's like a status or just it emotionally feels ready, but we'll, we'll kind of figure that out. I'm just watching my time. Okay, cool. Terminal emulation. So we can see here, we've got a modem connected to the user port, 2400 board. That should be enough for anyone. Um, usually when I tether to my phone, I complain about the speed. Now it's like, that so doesn't matter. Uh, whole lots of other good stuff. ANSI, yep, all good. So if I jump over, we're going to jump in. Oh, let me turn that status line off. That will confuse me. Okay, so if I jump over here, this is where I can take my, my good old ATI commands. We can see <laughs> how cute. The outgoing port is 1541, the number of the disk drive, and the incoming port is 64,000. Oh. Okay, so cool. I go to my phone directory. <laughs> it's a little slimmer than it used to be, but that's okay. And we're going to dial, instead of a phone number, retrodevopsbbs.com. Port 23. Um, I can run that at any port and probably should have to prevent people port scanning my telnet. Um, but on the website, which you saw earlier, there's also a um, BBS client, which will proxy through. And that's why I've left it that way. So you can go to the website, jump on there, and actually connect to the bulletin board and create an account for yourself, and away you go. And you've got to love security back in the day. Um, if you type in an account name that doesn't exist, it says, oh, there's no such account. Do you want to join and be one? It's like, yeah, okay. And then, oh, Okay, now I'm the SISOP, so it's going to ask me a few interesting little questions. It was character. Do you want to add a one-liner to give people a thrill? No. I'm going to get some electronic mail, and I'm guessing, yep, possible hack attempt. So that's all those North Korean friends. Good morning to you all. Okay, so here's our beautiful menu loading up at 2400 board. Now, again, mention where I said most of these bulletin boards assume you've got 80 columns, so I've kind of created a custom style to, A, not put as much on the screen because it takes way too long to draw, but you will still see some little wrapping things I haven't quite figured out. So we're going to go to the files area. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, you've got to wait sometimes. If we have a look at the files area, the one we're going to look at is uploads, but you'll see those ones that say FSX. So they're the areas where it's passing um, files around all the different boards. But we're going to go to one. Kept that simple because scrolling through a long list is not fun. We can go, let's have a list of the files. And we're going to see hopefully two things here, whatever the latest version is, because I only keep the latest ones. So one is we've, we've just put the program file, but then we've also created that disk image. So you can see here, hello2.zip, and then that little description underneath it, wrapped unfortunately, um, contains all the things. So how do we download this file? You'll notice on the menu there's no download command. Hmm. You tag it. Because remember, downloading takes a while. So the model back in the day is you'd browse around tagging the files, go and tell it to start the download, and then you know, you'd go and watch a couple of movies and you'd come back. All right. So we've tagged that file. Now if we come back a menu and we say downloads, well, yeah, why would I have typed download if I didn't want it? There's our file, 2K. Remember the compressed version? Now we've got to pick a protocol. Yeah, we have to know a little bit more back in the day. Okay, uh, Z modem sounds good. Uh, no. Okay, this is where you've got to hustle because we've got to tell it to start sending it and then tell the Commodore 64 to start receiving it. We've got to do that fairly quickly. Are we ready? What can possibly go wrong? Send that. Download. It's a program. Oh! Don't you love it? We can actually watch the bytes come down. Magic. So remember, this is 2K. Do you understand now why I didn't want the 100K uncompressed version? Come on, you're nearly there. You're nearly there. The bytes look so nice. Oh, thank God. Demo gods be praised. All right. Now, how do we get out of here? Well, not that simple. We go back to the main menu. And we're going to do it the quick way, which is we say goodbye. Isn't that nice? OK. Let's get out of here. Now, if the gods are kind, we will have, did I spell that right? Yes. <laughs> it's so hard because the key, it looks like a QWERTY keyboard, but little things like, you know, star, quotes, equals, have their own key somewhere else, not up on the top row, so it does kind of mess with your head a little bit. Uh, yeah, that should be fine. Oh, it found it. Fingers crossed, toes crossed. Please work. Hey! And how much better does it sound than the poor JavaScript version? 
We could just listen to that for a long, long time because I've got, got 10 minutes. Okay. So, I do not expect you to go home and have this insane desire to write 6502 assembly language. But, let's take a vote. Who agrees that at least satisfies the criteria it is not a cloud-friendly platform? We've added DevOps. Are we all agreed? Awesome, that was the whole point. Uh, no, I've got to stop. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry. It's not you, it's me. Okay, let's switch back over. So, so darn simple. Uh, where are we next to that? Hey, we're back. Okay, it's cool. So what do we do? Let's reflect. So I would argue, and I hope you'd agree, we've certainly got a productive in a dev loop. Okay, we've got everything that you could feel productive as a developer. I can't help you with the language, I'm sorry, that is what it is. But, you know, we've got an editor that our devs would know, probably our IT pros can use. If you have a look at the Stack Overflow stats um, in their surveys, it'll tell you the IT pros use Visual Studio Code now more than anything else, so that's good. Um, we did all our 8-bit stuff, but then we did our DevOps pipeline. Now, completely honestly, that was a very simple pipeline. But the point is, now we've got that end and working, all the other magic stuff that comes with Azure DevOps, we can just turn on. Right? So we can have approval flows that log tickets in service now. You know, we can do all sorts of cool and funky things. Um, but we've got a running pipeline. We're being pragmatic. Um, along the way, we also managed to do a little bit of Mr. Miyagi. We kind of snuck in some extra things there you would have seen, right? I didn't show it, but all the Azure resources there, obviously, are um, ARM templates that get deployed by another pipeline. The website's another pipeline. Uh, the extensions in GitHub and are deployed to the Azure Marketplace in a pipeline. Um, we managed to use IaaS, PaaS, and serverless stuff in there, right? So we used all the cloud things, awesome, and we got dashboarding, alerting, all that kind of good stuff. And again, we could have gone a lot further. The really funny thing, though, is as I built this out, and I kind of figured out bit by bit, it started to feel really familiar. And I thought, this is really strange. And then it finally dawned on me where I've done this. So some of the customers I've worked with are doing lots of IoT stuff. And if you have a look at the Microsoft recommended IoT Edge DevOps pipeline, it's exactly that. You do your stuff on your VS Code, you deploy on a dev branch, it deploys to simulated devices running on containers or VMs in the cloud to do your testing, merge that back and then push down to the IT Edge device to push out to your potentially really old hardware. So even though it's kind of a ridiculous example, the actual framework and model is completely valid. So now we've just got to ask one question after all that. Do we think Hans is happy? Hans is still not happy. Yeah, he buys it, he gets it, that it'll work, but it's also driving that everything's code now, infrastructure, everything, and we've got to say, yeah, 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 Hans, baby, it's okay. And in fact, to, to calm him even more, let me just go back to the original Commodore 64 training Don't let video. The technical stuff frighten you. It's only there to make everything work. Don't feel you have to be a programmer. You don't, although sometimes programming can be most of the fun. Why else would somebody stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning cursing and then claim the next day that they had a wonderful time? 1984, come on. We've all been there, right? Now, Hans hasn't been there, right? The Hanses of the world, they've developed in a different, different domain, right? Their world is all about stability, regularity, re you know, repeating. It's not about rapid change and learning. So there's a big shift for him. So, this is where the homework comes in. So I hope you've enjoyed that, I hope it was fun, I hope the people similar age to me are gonna run off immediately and start downloading some Commodore 64 stuff. But really, that's not the key takeaway. The key takeaway is, how do we make hands happy? Because we want happy hands. And this is where, you know, I put this down to something as simple as, for developers to really think about what it means to be a good DevOps citizen. So what can we do to help? Because we have lots of skills, right? We've lived in a code world for a long time. You know, we're really comfortable with things that code and how to work with code and how to collaborate with other people around code, right? Because you think about a lot of other types of um, IT people, people in tr traditional infrastructure environments, they collaborate, but they collaborate kind of at a planning level and then everyone goes and does their bit and then comes back. 
they're not used to that really necessarily that really short collaboration loop. So we can sort of share that experience. Also, I put there being practical. If anyone saw Damien's great talk yesterday on being pragmatic with DevOps, that's probably a better word. I should have put that. About being pragmatic, that things aren't going to be perfect. We're going to have to learn, and it's safe, and we can learn, and failure is not necessarily um, a bad thing unless it keeps happening. All right? But conversely, there's lots of things we can learn from these other, these other groups in the IT world, right? So being developers, we always want to try the newest and shiniest thing. We're not always necessarily that focused on reliability and testing things like as much as we should. So there's a whole there's groups of people in our industry that have really deep grained knowledge in those areas. So if we can kind of shift some of our knowledge right, shift some of their knowledge left, that helps with that whole DevOps pipeline. So that's the end of this today. Now, I will also point you to, this is the website. If you go to www.retrodevops.com, I've published details on all the equipment I've bought here and how it all works. There is the Commodore 64 emulator. You can go crazy and write your own code and do all kind of good stuff on there. There is also a, uh, the BBS terminal client. You can go and log on, create an account, join in that world and enjoy it. Uh, I hope that was useful. I hope you can take away and be either at least, either A, a better DevOps citizen, or at least have that mic drop moment to uh, share when you meet Hans or his brethren. Um, happy to take any questions, but other than that, thank you very much. <laughs>